In this short video, we're going to talk about the properties of operations on linear transformations and matrices. What properties are we talking about? Well, we're talking about arithmetic properties. And in many ways, linear transformations and matrices behave the same way as real numbers. For example, with addition, we have a community property. The sum of matrices can be formed in any order. A plus B is the same as B plus A. And we have associative properties. In other words, you can group them in any order with addition, and you'll get the same answer. We have a left distributive property for scalar multiplication. So if you have a sum of scalars times the matrix A, you can just take the first scalar, multiply it times A, plus the second scalar, multiply it times A, and add those together. And then we have a distributive property for scalars over the sum of matrices. And then there's an associative property of scalar multiplication. So if you have two scalars multiplied times a matrix, the way you perform the multiplication, either you could take the first scalar, times the matrix A, then multiply it times R, or you could take the product uh, of the scalars, then multiply it times A, or you could take the scalar R, multiply it times A, and then multiply it times the other scalar S. So that's nothing new. Uh, with matrix multiplication, we do have some properties which are the same as numbers. So we have a left distributive property. And we're going to see that it really does matter with matrices whether you're multiplying on the left or on the right. So we have a left distributive property and a right distributive property. And then there's the, an associative property of matrix products with a scalar. Uh, and we have an associative property of matrix products. So again, the grouping that you perform, that matrix multiplication, is going to result in the same answer. Uh, the matrix product A times A, and we will use exponents uh, when you have a, a repeated matrix product. It is a true multiplication. And so A squared, A cubed, they all have meaning. And um, But A times A can only be performed when A is square. And uh, the composition of T composed with itself can only be performed when T is an operator. So here's an example. If I'm going to take the 2 by 2 matrix with entries 2, negative 3, negative 4, 2, and I square it, I have to use my matrix matrix multiplication. So I'll go ahead and in this case, I can take the dot product of 2, negative 3 with 2, negative 4. That gives me 16. 2, negative 3 with negative 3, 2 gives me negative 12, and so on. So you know, what's important here is that um, we note that I don't take a squared A squared is not the square of the entries. So I don't take 2 squared and then negative 3 squared and then negative 4 squared times and 2 squared. That's just simply wrong, wrong, false, the wrong idea. You have to perform the proper matrix, matrix multiplication. And then from there, if you have A squared, you could also multiply that times A again. You get a cubed, and you can multiply a cubed times a, and then you're going to get a to the power of 4, and so on. So you can form powers of a, and then if we use those properties, we can actually define a matrix polynomial. If I have a scalar polynomial, I can replace the input with a matrix. The only thing that I have to be careful of is that since I will have matrices in every term with the except the constant term, 
In order to get a matrix here, I need to make multiply the constant term by the equivalent of 1 in matrices, which is the identity matrix. So x gets replaced with a, x squared gets replaced with, replaced with a squared, and so on. And then the constant term is multiplied by the corresponding identity matrix. So let's work this out. Let's evaluate this polynomial, p of x equals 5 minus 2x squared plus x cubed minus 2x to the fourth. And we're going to use that same matrix A that we had before because we recorded all of its powers. We know A, we know A squared, A cubed, and A fourth, A to the power of 4. We know all of those, so we should be able to evaluate this. So using those same powers of A, and of course 5 gets multiplied by the 2 by 2 identity matrix. Go ahead and make those substitutions and work it out, and we've got the value of P of A. So we can see that there's a lot of properties of matrix arithmetic which are similar to real numbers. Uh, Algebraically, we say that the n by n matrices, the square matrices, uh, the set of square matrices has a ring structure. But there are several very important differences. For example, matrices have what we call zero divisors. In other words, you can have two non-zero matrices, A and B, and their product can result in the zero matrix. Those are called zero divisors. So if I look at these two matrices, neither one A nor B is the zero matrix, but their product is the zero matrix. That's very different from real numbers. So that tells us that, um, you know, for example, I can't really use um, the zero products property of real numbers with matrices. I don't know if I have two matrices. Maybe I have something like A in parentheses B minus C equals zero. That does not mean that A equals 0 or B minus C has to equal 0. So that is very different with matrices compared to real numbers. Because here we have an example. Now you may say that, well, A and B have a lot of zero entries. That's the one, why they're, they're zero divisors. But no, it's easy to find uh, another example where neither A nor B uh, have uh, z any zeros in them, but their product is the zero matrix. And as an aside, let's just make an interesting observation here. What is the rank of the matrix A? Well, I can see that the columns are parallel to each other, so they're not linearly independent. But they're not all zeros either. So this is a rank 1 matrix. And I can say the same thing for B. I mean, the uh, columns are multiples of each other. Uh, so this is also a rank 1 matrix. But their product is rank 0. And we're going to learn that through multiplication, you can never increase the rank. So in other words, the product can never have a rank which is greater than the individual matrices but their product could actually be less. So that's just an interesting observation. Another big, big difference with uh, matrix multiplication versus multiplication with real numbers is that matrix multiplication is not commutative. In other words, A times B is almost never B times A. 
In fact, a times b may be defined, whereas b times a is not defined. So let's do a little review here. Suppose a is a 2 by 2 matrix, b is a 2 by 3 matrix. Then the product ab is defined, but ba is not. And the way that we look at this is we look at the order of a and the order of b. The inside numbers here have to be the same in order for the uh, product to be defined. The outside numbers tell me the order of the product. So in other words, AB will have two rows and three columns. And then we, the inside numbers have to match in order for the product to be defined. Let's look at an example. So here's A, a 2 by 2 matrix. B is a 2 by 3 matrix. The inside numbers match. So this product is going to be defined. And then the product should have two rows and three columns. And sure enough, it does. However, if I change the order and I attempt to multiply B times A, I can see that the inner numbers no longer match. I've got a 3 and a 2. That product is not defined. And once the product is not defined, there's no point in looking at the outer numbers. All right, so suppose that both products are defined. Well, it may be impossible to compare them because they may have different orders. So if A is 3 by 2 and B is 2 by 3, so again, the inner numbers here are the same, uh, then both products are, are possible because if I change the order, I'll have the same number on the inside. But A times B is a 3 by 3 matrix, but BA is a 2 by 2 matrix. Let's look at an example. So here is a 3 by 2 matrix. B is a 2 by 3 matrix. And sure enough, that product is defined. And the outer numbers are 3, so I'll have a 3 by 3 matrix as the product. And if I form B times A, the inner numbers are 3. So that product is defined. The outer numbers are 2. So the product is 2 by 2. So there's no way that AB could equal BA because they have different orders. So even if A and B are square, the order of multiplication matters. Let's revisit our zero divisors. All right? We had two product two pairs of matrices where their product was 0. So our first one was we had B and A of this form. We know that the product A times B is 0. But if I form the product B times A, I get 0, 1, 0, 0. So I get uh, a non-zero matrix. So A times B is different from B times A. And even and in our second example, the same thing holds true. We know that A times B is the zero matrix, or a matrix of all zeros. But if I form B times A, I get this matrix here, which is a rank 1 matrix. All right, so now let's talk about vectors written in different bases. So we already know that any vector can be written as a linear combination of our standard basis vectors. And that's a, it's a very simple linear combination. Each component really tells me the coefficient on our standard basis vectors. Or I could write it out in this way as well, using column vectors. But let's say we have another basis for R3. Let's look at this basis B. We've got three vectors. And in this case, it's pretty easy to see, without doing a lot of work, that we have a basis. Why is that? Well, we have three vectors for R3. That's not enough. We need to show that these three vectors are either linearly independent or span the space. And in this case, it's pretty easy to see that they are linearly independent because u2 and u3 both have a 0 in the first 
component. But U2 and U3 are not parallel to each other. They're not multiples of each other. Which I can say that U2 and U3 are definitely linearly independent. And then I look at U1. Well, U1 has a 1 in the first component, which says that it's introducing a new direction. No linear combination of U2 and U3 could ever generate a 1 in the first component. And so without finding the uh, any kind of uh, reduced row echelon form, we can uh, say that these vectors are linearly independent. We've got three of them. That's enough to say that we've got a basis. But if we're not clear about that, no problem. We can go ahead and put the vectors as the columns of a matrix, transform it to reduced row echelon form, and see that there's no free variables, so it's linearly independent or no free columns and therefore you have three linearly independent vectors in R3 it must form a basis. All right so we've established that we have indeed a basis. These three vectors u1, u2, and u3 form a basis and uh, so now we can write any vector as a linear combination of u1, u2, and u3. In particular our vector v with components 2, 4, and 3 should be uh, a linear combination of the vectors in b. So I should be able to find three components y1, or three coefficients y1, y2, and y3 such that using those co coefficients and taking a linear combination of the basis vectors I get the vector v. And so to determine those coefficients, we could also look at this as column vectors. And the reason why we write that as column vectors is because once again, we see we have a linear combination of columns on the left-hand side. And that's our column-centric view of matrix vector multiplication. Anytime we see a linear combination of columns, we can rewrite that as a matrix vector multiplication. So now I've got this matrix system of equations which I can solve by forming the augmented matrix and transforming it to reduced row echelon form. So that tells me what? That y1 has to equal 2, y2 equals 5, y3 equals 1. And uh, once I've got those coefficients now I know I can have a uh, li that linear combination, that linear combination of basis vectors uniquely defines the vector v. There's no other uh, linear combination which will uh, provide and, or will result in the vector v. And that has to do with the fact that this system of equation has a unique solution. So one way we can write that is we can say that the vector v has a coordinate vector in the basis or with respect to the basis b. So these coefficients 2, 5, and 1, I can put them in as if they were components, but then I have to specify that I'm taking these components not with respect to the standard basis, but with respect to the basis B. Now, sometimes we put the B subscript on the actual V, uh, but that's not really necessary. And uh, in some respects, it's probably not correct because the vector V doesn't depend on the basis in which you write the component vectors. But sometimes it's useful for us to, to put that subscript B uh, to emphasize that this is the vector B represented in a different basis. And we could also put a write it with a column vector with that subscript B. So that leads us to the question, what's the difference between a linear transformation T and a matrix representation of T? Well, even in the question, we get a hint 
because we have a linear transformation T and the fact that we say a matrix representation is telling us that there is not a single matrix representation of T. And in fact, the matrix representation of T depends on your choice of basis. But the transformation T, if T represents a rotation of 60 degrees, then it doesn't really matter how you write the matrix T. Um, it, the or what basis you use to determine the matrix uh, for T, it's still going to be, in the end, a rotation of 60 degrees. So what does it mean to write a transformation or have it write the matrix representation of a transformation T in a different basis? Well, let's just see, because you know, what that means is that since there's infinitely many bases for Rn, you can have infinitely many matrix representations. Each basis will lead to a different matrix representation. So let's review. The standard matrix representation, uh, it depends on the standard basis. The columns of the standard matrix for T are the images of the standard basis vectors. But suppose we have a different basis. We could still find a matrix representation of the linear transformation with respect to that basis. And how would we do that? Well, we would use the images of our different basis as the columns of T. So in the standard matrix representation, we use the images of the standard basis vectors. If I have a different basis, then I'll use the images of the basis vectors in that different basis B. And again, the columns of the matrix of T with respect to B are the images of the vectors in B. So let's look at an example. Suppose I'm given a basis in R3. Now, this particular basis, there is no shortcut to determine that these basis vectors are linearly independent. You're going to have to put them in the columns of a matrix and transform it to reduce row echelon form to verify that the columns are linearly independent, but they are. And um, suppose that we are told that T is a linear transformation from R3 into R5. So the output vectors have five components. And what we would like to do is find the standard matrix representation of T with respect to the basis B. And we like to find the image of U where U is a vector in R3 with components 4, 3, and 5. So the first part, finding the um, matrix representation of T with respect to B, uh, is uh, pretty simple because we are given the images of the vectors in B. We are told that T of V1 is the, the component, the vector with these components, T of V2 and T of V3. We know all of those vectors, those are given. So all I need to do is put them in order as columns, columns of the matrix. So the image of T of V1 is the first column, the image of T, I mean, sorry, the image of V2 is the second column, and the image of V3 is the third column. Now for the second part of this question, we're trying to find T of U, the image of U under the linear transformation T. Well, we're not given a formula for T, and we're not given the standard matrix for T. All we know is the images of V1, V2, and V3. But that should be enough. 
because u can be written as a linear combination of v1, v2, and v3 because they form a basis, they span the space, and that means that any vector can be written as a linear combination of those vectors. And if I use that fact, along with the fact that t is a linear transformation, then t of u is t of this linear combination of v1, v2, and v3. Well, additivity will say I can split that up into three vectors, and homogeneity says I can factor out the constants c1, c2, and c3. And so now I can find t of u as a linear combination of t of v1, t of v2, and t of v3. And all of those vectors are known. They're given to us. So the only thing that I don't know is c1, c2, and c3. But I should be able to determine those because remember, those are the coefficients from finding the linear combination of the basis vectors in B that gives me the vector u. And how would I find that? Well, I would go ahead and put the uh, basis vectors as the columns of a matrix. Uh, I would wind up with a system where the right-hand side would be the components of u, which were 4, 3, and 5. Transform that to reduced row echelon form, and that would give me c1 equals 3, and c2 equals 2, and c3 equals 1. So now I know everything in this linear combination. I know c1, c2, c3. t of v1, t of v2, and t of v3 were all given. So now I can go ahead and calculate it. So just to verify, again, c of 1 equals 3, c of 2 equals 2, and c of 3 equals 1. That means my vector u can be written as 3 times v1 plus 2 times v2 plus c3. And remember, these coefficients here are the components of the representation of u with respect to the basis b. So I could say that u has components 3, 2, 1 in the b basis. But again, I don't, I don't need that. That's just kind of an interesting connection to what we did previously. Because all I need to do is take 3 times t of v1, which is given, 2 times t of v2, again, that's given, plus t of v3. And that gives me the image of the vector u under the transformation t. Now let's explore this a little bit more. There is a connection between the matrix, matrix representation of t with respect to b and the image of u under t. Uh, the only thing is that in order to perform that uh, or determine that image of u, I need to multiply the matrix with respect to b times the vector u written in the b basis, not in the standard basis. So to clarify, Again, we found the image of u by taking this linear combination of vectors. And hey, a linear combination, as always, a linear combination of columns can be written as a matrix vector multiplication. But what are the columns? Well, the columns are t of v1, t of v2, t of v3. The columns are the images of the basis vectors. That is exactly uh, the matrix representation of T with respect to the basis B. And these numbers, 3, 2, 1, those are the coefficients of the vector U written in the B basis. So if the bases match, then you can perform the matrix vector multiplication. And so 
we're not going to take the matrix with respect to the B, B basis and multiply it times the components from the standard basis. That will not work. What we're going to do is take the matrix in the B basis, multiply it times the vector U written in the B basis, and that will give us our result. We are going to talk about this idea of representing vectors and matrices in different bases in great detail in the coming chapters. So if it doesn't make a lot of sense right now, review the examples. I think that it should become a lot clearer. Very similar definition to the original standard matrix representation. And I think that you'll find that it starts to make more sense.